there's an idea around, you know, that the situation with climate disruption is so bad that sort of there's nothing we can do. I completely disagree with that. Individually, we are all very, very powerful. And individually, we can do this. We can create the best world, be the best people, and we can opt for and create the best future. Welcome to the Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina, and I'll be your host today as we discuss eating for the future. It's an interesting topic. All living beings, except for those who photosynthesize, have to eat. Of course, this is a decision that we make every day of our lives. What is it that we're going to eat? How will this benefit our body? How will this be pleasing to our taste buds? And then, of course, what effect this has on the environment really has, I would say, a background feel for most people. It's just not something that we think about. However, I would like to propose the idea that we don't have that luxury anymore. We no longer have that luxury for many reasons, for many reasons. But one of the things that I want to start this conversation with is a quote from Charles Darwin. And he said, the love for all living creatures is the most noble attribute of man. The love of all living creatures. Now, he didn't say the love of men, the love of people, the love of children, the love of everything that lives. And so I have to ask for my part, how can we love and kill at the same time? Now, I know that sounds extreme, but if you just stay with me for a minute, uh, just think about it now. In order to have that hamburger or the pepperoni on the pizza that is so delicious, someone did have to die. Someone did have to die for that. So then we have to ask ourselves, is pleasing our taste buds at its most base level, worth a life. Is pleasing our taste buds worth a life? Then we also have to look at what the consumption of meat and dairy is doing to the body politic or to public health. And we know that processed meat is a carcinogen. It is labeled as such, leads to various types of cancer and dairy also is implicated in breast cancer for women. Now, whether this is part of the natural substance or the chemicals that are used in the production of that substance is up for debate, and that's not what I'm speaking to, but I will put forth the idea that it is harmful to our health to consume animal products. It is harmful. We know that the most lived, longest lived people on the planet are in the so-called blue zones. Very few of them left, actually, as more and more of these societies adopt the standard American diet. Sad for short, because it is quite sad. As I know it, the one of the strongest blue zones that is still holding its place is that of the Seventh-day Adventists. They don't drink, they don't smoke, a vegetarian, largely vegan and the longest lived people on the planet. It used to be Okinawa, but now they've taken over the charge of the, the value menu deal at McDonald's. Now, you can buy two Big Macs and a Coke for one ninety nine. That's a great savings, right? But you may end up paying for it in the end with hospital bills. And of course, we're all gonna pay for those choices on the effect of the planet. So as these burger outlets need their meat, and a lot of it because people are awfully hungry, they need a lot of cows. And cows take up 30% of land mass, 30%. 
Now, as more and more people start adopting the standard American diet, we need more and more livestock. And what does that mean? It means cutting down forests and rainforests in order to have land for them to graze so that we can have more and more cows so we can sell more and more burgers. And selling more and more burgers, it's just this vicious cycle, this vicious cycle. It takes 1,800 gallons of water to make a single pound of grain-fed beef. That's water that many, many people are not getting, the safe and clean drinking water. So I ask you, as we embark on this discussion, is it worth the 1,800 pounds or gallons of water to have the one pound of beef? Is it worth taking that out of a child's mouth in order for you to have the value meal? This is a real question. It's rhetoric, of course, but I, it's food for thought, so to speak. And I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Peter Carter, who I know is uh, very invested in this topic. Peter, please share with us your thoughts on the standard American diet or whatever it is that you have in mind regarding this topic. Thank you, Virginia. And that's a very excellent comprehensive coverage of what we've been told for many, many years is the situation. Um, but the situation is getting worse, largely because the so-called developing world, particularly China, is following our carnivorous, uh, dangerous, bad habits in the West, and particularly North America. So although veganism and vegan products are uh, increasing in popularity in the so-called developed world, the opposite is happening in the developing world. So that's really, really tragic. As a result, more animals being killed, more cattle being raised and killed, more meat is being eaten than ever. So um, that really means more and more and more education. So I'm really glad we're covering this. I'm going to start with actually what is my favorite quote from a lecture, which I heard years and years and years ago by a relatively young Bill McKibben, who um, went on to be a famous um, green architect guru. And he opened this lecture to the Harvard Medical School by saying, here's the question, guys. How do we love all the children of all of the species for all time? And I thought, wow, oh my gosh, that's quite a, um, but it's right. Because it's the question of how do we become ethical beings, how to become friendly beings to the rest of life, including ourselves. And, you know, we just had this fantastic paper published by Bill Ripple and a great team in uh, which he pointed out in detail that life on our planet is in peril because of uh, unmitigated climate disruption. Our emissions are just going higher and higher and higher. It's absolutely insane. So we, I agree, we have to pose this question to ourselves, right? Um, how can we help create the best world possible? Because if you're talking about improving your diet and becoming vegetarian, then becoming vegan, you're creating the best well world out there. And as you have said, you're creating the best internal world at the same time. So let's switch this uh, horror of our climate situation and be as positive as we can. So, yeah, we can all, each one of us, uh, dream of and help create the best world possible and we can be the best people in doing so and we can do that so that we can leave a legacy a decent legacy for our children and all the world's children so surely we all want to do that there's an idea around you know that the situation with climate disruption is so bad that sort of there's nothing we can do i completely disagree with that Individually, we are all very, very powerful. And individually, we can do this. We can create the best world, be the best people, and we can opt for and create the best future. So I said, um, I was brave enough to say some years ago, that without the world veganizing, uh, we couldn't possibly uh, control the climate. Well, guess what? There's a paper that was just published this year, which I'm glad to say uh, agreed with that. So I'm going to mention a couple of papers here. So in uh, March of 2023, there was a paper called Future Warming from Global Food Consumption. And um, uh, uh, they crunched the numbers. And wow, um, if we carry on eating uh, as we are in a highly unethical and 
not very sane manner, we can push the climate up to another one degree C by 2100. And that's absolutely huge. And 75% of this extra warming is driven by foods, quote, that are high sources of methane. That's ruminant meat, cattle, dairy, and rice. Rice wetland cultivation is the other big source of methane. And I know that's a difficult one, but that's mentioned in this paper. There was another uh, paper published this year in June, which is called Changes in Global Food Consumption Increase Greenhouse Gas Emissions. And that pointed out that the emissions have now reached 30%. If we factor in methane uh, correctly, of course, it's quite a lot more than 30%. And again, this is largely triggered, the paper says, by beef and dairy consumption in rapidly developing countries. China, which is the world's top food producer and consumer, also has the largest uh, cattle herd. When you look at cattle concentration and the maps for this, and the cattle are, are in red dots, China's really all red. It's even more red than India with all the cattle that they uh, use for their uh, dairy consumption. So I also want to mention the um, uh, excellent chart, which was included in the IPCC 2019 land report. And this chart compares every single diet combination that you can imagine uh, with respect to its greenhouse gas emissions impact effect. And not only does veganism come out on top, it's 30% better than vegetarian with regards to greenhouse gas emissions. So that's worth knowing. It's 120% better than our standard so-called American diet. So I would have to say that it's really our duty to ourselves, to our own health. You're so right in that, um, Regina. And also to the future and also to all life on this planet because with our emissions, and that includes a lot of methane now, with our emissions, as Bill Ripple and his team have pointed out, all of life on this planet is in peril and we have put life in peril. So we can correct that individually, each one of us. So my final word would be, this is not a new idea. Compassion to animals, not eating meat, not hurting other living beings, goes back over 3,000 years. Jainism, which is the origin of Ahimsa, is actually a evolution, if you want, from the Vedic Indian ancient scriptures. This is not a new idea. A lot of people have figured this out thousands of years ago and since written great books that this is the way to live fully. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. You covered a lot of ground and I agree so much. It's funny to me when people so often refer to uh, vegetarianism and especially veganism as extreme. You know, it's like that somehow is extreme, whereas growing animals in deplorable conditions and feeding them food that they're not accustomed to and therefore stuffing them full of antibiotics so that they don't die when they're eating food that makes them sick before they're slaughtered. That's not extreme. It's really an amazing thing. And of course, this points to the agricultural industrial complex which has taught us that we absolutely must have animal products in order to survive. When of course, it's not the truth, not the truth at all. And as I've mentioned, the longest lived people on the planet, it used to be Okinawa, are those who live on a largely vegetarian diet. And of course, using food that could go to humans to raise meat food that goes to only a few humans is immoral at its core. And then of course, we're looking at a lot of food waste. We have a lot of wastage in the system. And this of course, emits more methane into the atmosphere. So I'd like to hear more about the science of this from Paul. Yes, uh, thank you. One of the biggest ways in which climate can severely impact humanity and civilization is, of course, by the global food supply. The supply of food and the supply of water on the planet, those things are all shifting as the climate system rapidly changes. It wouldn't be surprising to me if we hit some global food crisis, global food shortages within 
say five to 10 years, especially if we get tipping points crossed, for example, the ocean currents tip, then our ability to grow food like grains will decrease by 50 to 60%. Same thing with maize, corn, things like that. So we don't have, as you said originally, Regina, we, it's not a luxury to do things differently with our food supply. It's, a, it's an absolute necessity and it'll be a matter of survival. Most people are aware that we waste tremendous amounts of food, maybe even 30 to 50% of food. So when we do hit global food shortages and price spikes, you know, I think that waste will be kind of like a cushion. We'll actually be glad that we have that cushion. We can stop wasting food and it's like we increase our supply by a third, but that's only, you know, a short term sort of solution. Climate is degrading the quality of food, the quality of the soils, the nutrients are being used up in the soils. So the foods that are grown on those soils are having less nutrients. And, you know, eating a tomato or an apple today does not provide us the same nutrition that doing so, you know, eating an apple or tomato even 20 years ago gave us far more nutrition than it does today because we're losing nutrition in in our existing foods the quality is going down so there is a lot of push to you know people need to eat less meat obviously or or no meat we need to go back to eating things that are lower on the trophic level of food chain if you like because then we avoid you know there's a lot more food available like we simply can't continue to have our population growing it as it is and eating the foods that we're presently eating. So there's a lot of research on getting alternatives to replace meat products, especially um, with plant-based products um, that have a decent taste. Some of the technologies are good enough that, you know, you're eating what you might think is a hamburger and it's uh, all plant-based. And there's even some new technologies, some papers recently on things like something called precision fermentation. So fermentation is ancient, right? The you know making beer and wine and and yogurts and things from from yeast. Those processes are well known, but there's some interesting work being done incorporating vertical farming of things like uh, mushrooms, for example, and adding some materials, probiotics and things, so that these things grow and they actually taste like for example, bacon. I mean, you know, some people joke to me and say, I'd never be able to give up bacon, right? I mean, the smell of bacon, you know, the taste of it, but there's actually substitute product that can be developed using things like precision fermentation to create a food that is pretty much indistinguishable in taste from the meat-based product. So, you know, I always tell people about the green revolution, remind them about you know, years ago when population was increasing rapidly, and it still is, but there were people that would say, well, we're just going to run out of food. I mean, the Club of Rome did a lot of stuff on limit to growth. And then the Green Revolution came along, and basically we're using fossil fuel-based products to produce pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, which allowed us to provide enough food to the growing populations. But you know, as we come to a fossil fuel constrained world by necessity, if we stop using fossil fuels for fertilizers, we'd actually have enough food to feed only half the world with present consumption patterns like the American diet, you know, for example. So so we don't have any choice. We have to go to more, you know, a more plant-based uh, food society just to survive on this planet with the growing numbers of population. You, put, you touched on so many important topics, Paul, and I think one of the things that's especially important is if we continue to grow animals because we like the way they taste, we're going to continue to destroy our planet with pollutants and foster an environment in which people who are poor are not able to get the adequate intake of food and calories that they need to sustain themselves. We see this all over the world, whereas, you know, if we had a fruit, vegetable, grain-based diet, we would have plenty. There would be plenty enough to go around. And as Peter said, this is something we can all do. This is a responsible action that we can take. There are no 
downsides to it. It's good for our health. It's good for our planet. It helps prevent starvation and malnutrition in children around the world. It's a net gain for everyone. Um, so I, I highly encourage, you know, if you are a meat eater, please don't see this as an attack. This is not, this is not what that is. What it is, is we just want to get out that information that there are other ways. For those of you watching, I'm pretty sure that you want to educate yourself and others in your circle and do the good things that you can do for the planet. Because on so many other levels, there's not much we can do, but this this we can do. So I'm hoping that you'll find this as an empowering topic, not one that uh, makes you feel guilty or bad. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it back to Peter. No, you know, I agree. I, I mean, this is a very positive thing. This is as positive as we can get, right? About life, about ourselves, and about all the life that we share this planet with. I just wanna repeat something that we have known for many, many years. The issue is survival. That's the issue. When the Bill Ripple paper says that um, life on Earth is in peril, it is. All of life is in peril because atmospheric greenhouse gases are at unprecedented highs. They're increasing at unprecedented rates. CO2, methane, and to a slightly less extent, nitrous oxide. We have to stop this. The only way to stop it is to um, stop a lot of things that we are doing. And that will make life very much better for us individually and all of us. So the world population cannot eat meat anymore. Let me be very clear about that. The numbers are definite. The research is now in, which I've just quoted. We can't eat meat. We can't continue raising cattle, slaughtering cattle at a rapidly increasing rate as the global cattle herd, so-called, is. And we can't eat dairy products anymore. That's very, very hard for the people in India, who I respect their traditions a lot, but the numbers are definite. I mean, years and years ago, we were told that atmospheric methane had increased two and a half times. It's now like 2.66 times fold increase. I mean, it, it's unbelievably massive. And as I found out years ago when I decided to check, yeah, oh my gosh, the cattle herds. It, it, it's not like, you know, milking cows like I was a boy in England on the farm anymore. We're talking big industry here. And when you actually look, you can see the films and photographs, it's pretty damn horrific. So, but it's a big source of methane and we have to stop that. And that is a survival issue now. So veganism means no meat, right? I don't use the term plant-based diet. It means um, no dairy, no milk, no cheese. And as Paul has said or inferred, there's no excuse anymore. I mean, the choices out there for vegan meats and dairy and cheese and milk, I mean, it's everywhere. Every, every supermarket you go to here, you're going to find them. Vegan also means no fish, right? I mean, we, we are trashing the, the oceans. The uh, fishing fleets are an unbelievable size, particularly, of course, the Chinese fleet. China's sort of now taken over from the United States, being bigger everything, and bigger, of course, like the United States, also means worse. So um, I guess I'll finish off by saying that small is beautiful, right? That's that great book, um, uh, what was entitled some years ago. We have to adopt a lifestyle of friendship and kindness with all of life, all of people. I agree with Antonio Guterres. We have to stop our wars, and that includes the war on nature. And all other wars have to stop. It's just the belief system we've got. It's a habit we've got into. It's not natural. It's not natural to go around killing other people, and it's not natural, as Regina describes, to be breeding these animals in a factory industry manner where they really never experience life at all, just so that we can slaughter them and eat them. That's not right, and it is against our future survival today. 
So thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. I think part of the reason that we see it as natural, and I did, I was convinced of certain things. I, I've been, well, I don't want to say how many years I've been vegetarian. Let's just say lots. Uh, but before that, I was very confused, and there's a good reason for that. And I've mentioned it, the agricultural industrial complex. They spend a lot of money entering schools. They have uh, various programs on health and health classes, on teachers teach kids false information on the importance of meat. They have hamburger days in schools, and of course the kids love that. I want to just touch on one aspect of the misinformation campaign, because I've been seeing a lot of it lately, and that is the misinformation campaign about these mock meats, uh, you know, like Impossible Burger, uh, Beyond Burger. I have seen a lot of discussion about how these are filled with additives, these are filled with chemicals, they're very unhealthy. I want you to, if you feel that way, I want you to go pick up a package, look at the back of it and see the ingredients. There's not that many. And then I want you to look at what goes into creating the meat, the meat that we have. And again, I mentioned all of the antibiotics that go into every meat product that is eaten to prevent them from dying from the horrible, crazy diet that we give them. But not just that, also uh, the hormones. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion about bovine growth hormone. It's not healthy. It's not healthy at all. So it's just amazing to me that the meat industry has all these shadow campaigns where they have influencers on Instagram and YouTube and TikTok talking about the harmful uh, aspects of mock meats. When mock meats have actually been eaten in parts of Asia and China for thousands of years. So it's nothing new. It's only new to people in the West and to Americans who just absolutely love that meat. Please know that we have an obesity epidemic in the United States. The consumption of animal products and the increased consumption of animal products is no mistake in this. Of course, we have diabetes, kidney failure. There's just too much that goes into the processing of animals meat that is harmful to humans. Plants, fruits, grains, these are the way to go if you want a long, healthy life. And of course, if we wanna keep living on this planet, there's no way around it. So let's hear it from you, Paul. Of course, along with the climate crisis, we have the biodiversity crisis. And a big contributor to the biodiversity crisis is, is using, you know, replacing natural forests and natural grasslands, et cetera, with monoculture cropping and also with uh, livestock raising, you know, on these lands. And um, the scale of the farming industry is just unbelievable. For example, you know, if you take all of the birds on the planet of every species and add them all together and add them all up, the numbers, those numbers are dwarfed by the number of chickens on the planet, for example, right? <laughs> and the chickens, many of the chickens are raised in unnatural methods to make them, you know, as fat as possible to provide as much meat as possible. So they're very unhealthy and, you know, you need all of these antibiotics, et cetera, to keep diseases from spreading. So, you know, we're, of course, ingesting all of those when we ingest that food. I'm glad you brought up the obesity crisis because that is costing the U.S. and other countries around the world billions and billions of dollars. It's extremely expensive, not to mention the health issues to people, the shortened lifespans, the huge stresses on the healthcare system as people suffer all of these cardiovascular uh, issues from being overweight. And these are problems that are totally unnecessary. People don't need to go on diets in order to lose the obesity. If they switched their what they were eating and ate what was comfortable, what would fill them up, they would, because of the healthier foods, uh, you know, the vegan, the plant-based diets, they're they're going to become healthier, whether they like it or not. It's not It's not necessary. They just have to change one thing. And all of these other positive things can happen. Their lifespan can go up. They can feel more energetic. They can want to partake in more physical activities and uh, have quite different lives just from changing the, that one factor. And of course, you know, that changing that one factor will, will make a, the difference 
to the climate like night and day. It goes a long way to reducing per capita emission by just changing what, what you eat. I'm glad you brought up the obesity epidemic because it's also a healthcare epidemic, a health system epidemic. And people, when they're, he when they're healthier, when they're eating good foods, uh, they're much more productive. So it's, it leads into every aspect of society, really. Thank you for bringing up all of those really important points, Paul. We really shortchange ourselves so much when we blindly accept what the agricultural industrial complex tells us is food. We shortchange ourselves, we shortchange the planet. And we have so much potential for good as human beings. I just want to embrace that notion that we can go against the fabrications of big ag, just like we totally understand that the cigarette industry was lying to us, so is this industry. It is towards the end of October here, and we just had what is referred to as a catastrophic storm in Acapulco, Mexico. I live in New York City. It's in the mid-70s today, and it's going to reach 80 degrees in the next few days. Now, in my life in New York City, 80 degrees in the end of October, almost November, is unprecedented. The signs are all around us. They cannot be ignored any longer. Every choice we make is an moral imperative. So I beseech you, I beseech you, before you sit down to the next meal, consider what the actual costs are. And I want to give you great consideration for joining us. And for those of you who have subscribed, thank you. We appreciate and love our subscribers like this video and share it with a friend. And we look forward to seeing you next time with the Climate Emergency Forum.